Amen. Good morning, everybody. And that last song had a little punch to it, didn't it? Make you want to get up off your feet and do something. Amen. If you can't dance, you can at least attempt to dance. Amen. You know, sometimes it's not all about the execution of what we do. It's about putting forth the effort. And uh, you'd be amazed at how many people don't want to put, put forth the effort to serve God. Just won't even try. They just give up before they even start. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes, Amen. That wasn't a part of the sermon. That was just a little bit extra. You can see the, uh, the church accountant to uh, pay that 25 cent for that extra. <laughs> Amen. Amen. How's everybody this morning? Great. Amen. Great. Amen. Uh, I saw the rain coming down as I was leaving, so I had to wait a couple minutes. I pray, I said, okay, God, um, I got to get in the car. So, you know, if you could stop the rain for a little while here, and then probably four or five minutes later, the rain stopped. And I'm not trying to act like I'm some kind of special person, but I put forth the effort to ask. Amen, and God responded. Amen, and I believe that. Yeah, the clouds move, but who controls the clouds? Amen. Who put the water in the clouds? Amen. I'd like to see you uh, go ahead and strike a match and watch the uh, smoke go up and see how much water come out of it. Amen. Amen. We don't make the clouds. Amen. Uh, anybody ever heard the saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me or harm me? Okay, that's a lie. If you heard that before, I understand the sentiment behind it, but it's not true. I'll give you an example. Anybody who's gone through any kind of tragedy or any kind of hurt or pain in their lives, and somebody comes along and says, I know exactly how you feel. Do they really know exactly how you feel? No. So their words actually hurt you. I mean, you understand the sentiment behind it. But those words hurt, especially when you have a special hurt that only corresponds to your life. And you're thinking in your mind, okay, I understand what you're trying to do, but you really, really, really don't know how I'm feeling right now. Because you might be in that place. And everybody ever been in that place? And you know the only person, I won't say person, you know the only, only that could get you out of that place was God. Amen. So I said that for a reason. Um, the sermon scripture is Acts chapter 7, verse 56. Acts chapter 7, verse 56. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And so once you read through the chapter, which we will a little bit later on, you'll see that it's talking about Stephen or Stephen or Stephanos, as they call him in the Greek who was stoned, right? And actually, Stephen means crowned one of the, he was one of the seven deacons, and we'll read a little bit about that as well. And it says he was the first Christian martyr, but you know, I don't agree with that. He may have been the first martyr after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but he definitely wasn't the first Christian martyr. Amen. How about we go back to, uh, Cain and Abel. Abel was killed for his service to God, right? Okay, just give you something, a little bit of something to think about there. Amen. <laughs> uh, Pastor Westfall, would you come up and bless us with a prayer for the sermon? I know you didn't expect it, but uh, I had it in my heart probably all week, and I thought, man, who better? Amen. The Lord says to be in season and out, and we have to serve him fully. Father God, we just come to you right now, and we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that comes in like a light, like a flood, into this place. And Father God, you anoint the word that is being preached today, God. We thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy upon our lives. We thank you that you said your word will go forward. It will not return void, but it will accomplish what it's set out to do. 
So today we receive the word with gladness, with a heart that says, thank you, Lord, that you take care of me and you love me. And I pray a special anointing on the pastor today that you bless him, cause his words to go forward in a powerful way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, my brother. Appreciate it. Amen. It's good to be able to call on a member of the community to come up and pray and seek the face of God on your behalf. Amen. 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 And we thank you for it. Thank you, Pastor Westfall, for those kind words and that prayer unto God that I believe God heard. Amen. The title of the sermon is The Word Won't Harm Me. The Word Won't Harm Me. Church, let us begin at the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, and we'll go to about verse 4 or so, and then we'll skip down to verse 26. So Genesis 1, uh, down to about verse 4, and then verse 26. Brother Greg, would you come for a moment and grab this uh, scripture sheet? As you know, I generally try to provide a scripture sheet so that you don't miss uh, parts of your notes. There are a lot of scriptures, and I may read fast at times. But they are all on the sheet as far as I know. Amen. Amen. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And so the point of me reading this, I'm laying a little bit of a foundation for the, the remainder of the sermon. Just so you know, it may be like in your mind, what, what is he talking about? So that's what I'm trying to do. So just bear with me. It won't be long. I'm just trying to lay a, lay a little bit of a foundation to get to where we need to go. Amen. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. Amen. Everybody say good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Amen. Amen. Remember that. In verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Amen. And as a sidebar, Dominion, rule, subjugate, dominate, prevail, against, reign, take, dominion, amen. Now church, is this what men are known for? Dominion? Anybody? Anybody? Is this what men are known for? Amen. I mean, we're here to tell the truth, right? Amen. So I want to, I'm sorry for the non-sports people, but I have to make a sports analogy. Um, football, hockey, basketball, et cetera, soccer. Um, especially football, since it's football season now. You see those guys when they get down on their, on their two fingers and then they move the ball from one guy to the other, and he goes back to throw it to somebody. Do you ever hear the sounds they make when they're doing all that stuff? Where's the fence? Is Vince in here? Tell Vince to come on in here. You would be amazed at some of the sounds that these people make. They sound like uh, rhinoceroses, rhinoceri. Is it rhinoceri? Rhinoceros. <laughs> they sound like elephants. They sound like lions. They sound like animals. And oh, by the way, women tennis players do that too, right? Amen. If you ever hear them grunt when they hit the ball, you can hear it across the stadium without a microphone, by the way. Vince, do you, you believe football players are kind of brutal? <laughs> so the question is, and that's just football, basketball. I mean, if you ever watch YouTube, which I'm sure some of you do, They'll show you the 10 greatest dunks of all time, and most of them involve embarrassing somebody else. 
You know, and then they look over the guy while he's on the ground. Like, why didn't even try? You're too little for me. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And we won't get into hockey, right? The first time I saw hockey in high school, I didn't know what it was. I was like, what are they doing? Nobody's playing hockey, they're just fighting. And since I was 16, 17, I was like, oh, this is really cool. Watch that. Oh, he pulled his shirt over his head, just stopped pounding on the guy. Hockey's good. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, is there any sport where this mindset is not the end goal? You know, no pun intended, the end goal, not the purpose. Any sport. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's pool. The ultimate goal is to win, to dominate. Would you agree? Okay. So how about the ladies? Um, all right, let me look around. Okay. So how about the ladies? Don't you want to slay in your new red church dress? Yes. Amen. And dominate the conversation of others as you subjugate us all to your queenly reign and your endearing beauty and grace. Amen. So it's not just men, is it? But it's women also. It did say, uh, uh, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. Said them, right? Okay, man, woman was taken from man, and one wouldn't be them, would it? Okay, it's got to be at least more than one to be them. Okay, Genesis 1 and 27. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Amen. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Let us continue on in the beginning. John chapter 1. We'll go to about verse 5. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So the question is, have you ever wondered why this sentence, the second one, the second verse, is there because it already told you in verse one in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God the same was in the beginning with God why, why does it say that God is the word amen the word was not created after God at a separate time I bet you want me to repeat that again don't you the word was not created after God at a separate time Amen. The existence of the Word and God are one existence. One spirit at one time, that time being the beginning. Amen. This is all leading up to the sermon. Don't get nervous. I'm not off on a rabbit trail. Not yet anyway. Amen. It's, it's all purposeful. Amen. John chapter 1 verses 3 through Five. John chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Light and darkness. John chapter 3, verses 16 through 21. John chapter 3. Verses 16 through 21. We've got to get read on the time here. Okay, that clock's a little bit fast. Okay. For God so loved the world, you'll recognize the scripture, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verse 19. And this is the condemnation. The light is coming to the world. Light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, 
that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Now, for some background on Stephen, or Stephanos, or Stephan, whichever you prefer. Light and darkness. Acts chapter 6, uh, verses 1 till about verse 11. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. So I'm starting here because um, I want to give you a little background on Stephen. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Everybody recognize that? Amen. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, is it, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen. So Stephen was one of the deacons, the original deacons that were appointed by the apostles. Is that right? Amen. A man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. You know what a proselyte is? It's a newbie, newly converted. Amen. Newly converted person. That's a good thing, right? People come into the faith, you recognize their faith, and that they're honorable among men, and you appoint them to be somebody who has responsibility in ministry because you already see it on them. You don't have to wait around 20 and 30 years for him to show his worth to God. It's already evident. And so that was the case with Nicholas. Amen. Is that okay? Verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So the deacons were appointed, and the ministry grew. Amen. We have any deacons in here? Raise your hand. Everybody know who you are? At least three. Amen. Rick's in the kitchen. Who else we missing? That's it. Amen. So the word of God increased. Verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Okay. Not only was he one of the newly appointed deacons, but he also was full of faith and power. Verse 9. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. So already somebody trying to start an argument. Uh, these days we would call them haters, right? The haters are already out. The trollers, right? Amen. Verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Suborned. To instruct privately. Instigate. To bribe. To induce someone unlawfully or secretly to perform some misdeed or commit a crime. Or to give false testimony. So they went out and found some liars, basically. Troublemakers. All right? Verse 12, and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. Instead of false witnesses, verse 13, which said, this man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this, that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs from which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. So all these people heard all these things, and when they looked at him, they couldn't find any truth in his face. 
in his demeanor, in the way he looked and carried himself. Is that how we are? When we hear things about people, do we take time to seek God? Hey, is this true or is this false? Or we just, oh, well, yeah, he said, and I really know this guy. He follows politics, so he must know what he's talking about. Is that how we are? Of course we are. Until God straightened us out. Right? Amen. And when God straightened you out, you go, oh, 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 man, I didn't know. Now you know. Amen. It's a good thing. Amen. Acts chapter 7, verse 1. Acts chapter 7, verse 1. And uh, we'll read a good portion of this. We'll go to verse 3, and then I'll skip down to 51. Because from verse 3 to down to 51 is a history lesson of Old Testament happenings and people. So I won't take the time to read it. But just so you know, uh, that's what it is. And you can go back and read it later on today or whenever you have time or make time. Then it said the high priest, Acts chapter 7, verse 1, are these things so? And he said, men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he left Sharon. And said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I shall show thee. So then Stephen began to give him a history lesson. And we'll go down to verse 51. Ye stiff necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the, dispens by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. So he's having this conversation before men, the religious people of the day, he's saying, hey, you stiff neck and uncircumcised and hardened ears, he's just telling them how bad they are and the mistakes they've made and how they are now trying to speak against what he's saying, which is the same truth that their fathers fought against. So how many believe that, you know, it's probably not going to go well for Stephen after this? Amen. Verse 53, well, verse 54, I'm sorry. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Now, you know, I've seen some horror movies before where they had these extended teeth and all these, this weird looking monster stuff in people's mouths. But, but the, I mean, this is not a horror movie, this is the Bible. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. What is this, kindergarten or something? These men supposed to be men of God, have turned into something else. They're not ministers anymore. Amen. There's something else. Verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. He wouldn't even look at them. They were of no consequence to him. It's like, what's the point? I can't reason with these people. So he just looked up to heaven and he saw Jesus at the right hand of God. Now, how many know Jesus don't have hands? Not in heaven. God don't have hands, right? God's the spirit. So he don't have hands. So if he's standing at the right hand of God, what does that mean? Power and authority. And he had the image in his mind, however that image was that God gave him. Probably to him it looked like a physical presence or maybe not. But whatever he saw, he recognized it as Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Amen. That way, when your friends try to trip you up with this, whoa, God doesn't have hands. How is Jesus up there? Say, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And that's true. But now you have an answer. Amen. Amen. Verse 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. Wait, what? So he's talking and they start doing this. Uh, 
Anybody ever seen a child do that? Or maybe it was you. <laughs> Men love darkness more than light. That's why we went over those Old Testament scriptures. Light, darkness. Amen. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And Saul became who? Paul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Who called upon God and said, Lord Jesus, re receive my spirit? It was Stephen, right? It wasn't them. It was him. Now, I recognize if you read that, it's kind of, uh, okay, who's talking here? And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So, we're almost done, church. What does this have to do with me and you? Do you ever wonder why certain things happen to you that are far beyond what you think you deserve in this life? I read it again. Do you ever wonder why certain things happen to you that are far beyond what you think you deserve in this life? I had a uh, nephew, wonderful young man. And uh, he played football, and he was being recruited by Boston College and some of these big northern schools up there, places I'd never been. And uh, the police came to my sister's house about 11 that night or 10 or 9.30, whatever time it was, uh, telling her that her son had been shot and killed right around the corner from the house. Now, he was coming from either football practice or school that day with his backpack. And the only way they knew where he lived is because he had recruiting letters in his backpack from these colleges. And I thought, wait a minute. I'm in the faith. This, this is not supposed to happen to me. It's not supposed to happen to my family. What kind of nonsense is this? So that's why I asked that question. It wasn't necessarily for you, but it was something I had experienced myself. Do I ever wonder why certain things happen to me that are far beyond what I think I deserve in this life? Amen. 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 Church, we will not be spared heartache, grief, stress, pain, temptation, persecution, fear, aggravation, you fill in the blank. Amen. Second Timothy 3, verses 10 through 12. Second Timothy 3, verses 3 through 12. And this is Paul giving some instructions to Timothy. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all, the Lord delivered me out of some of them. What's wrong? It doesn't say some of them? How many does it say? Oh, I can't even hear that. What did you say? So God delivered them out of all of them. Whatever they are, I can make a list, but I might miss somebody's list, label. You fill in the blank. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Thank you, uh, Sister Nubia, the warfare is real. 
Amen. Thank you, ladies. I don't know if that was, you know, on the sheet you were reading from or whatever, but I, I like it. The warfare is real. It's not a game. Uh, I'll leave that alone. Mark chapter 13, verse 20. Mark chapter 13, verse 20. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake. That's us. Whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. Brother Kevin is clapping. He like, thank you, Jesus. You ever go from one day to the next, you go, man, what did I do yesterday? And what day is this? It's like the day went by so fast. And I'm not saying um, that necessarily we can always tell unless God show it to us. You know, we don't have any innate ability to say, oh, I know this day was 0.55667 seconds shorter than yesterday. I'm sure there's some NASA people who get into all that kind of stuff. I don't. Don't have time. <laughs> John 16 and 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. But in the world, in the world, ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So there is hope, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 and 13. We're almost done. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand and take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. So here's a question. What if God didn't make a way of escape for us? And so here's your homework. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. We won't read it here, but I will say, once you read these three scriptures, you will come to the conclusion that it's not up to you whether or not you're tempted to some, to some extent. And that you overcome that temptation. It says in that scripture that Satan takes you whenever he gets ready. So if you don't have God to intervene on your behalf, you jacked up. You ever wonder why people do the stuff they do that you see on the news? Because they're taken captive by Satan whenever he gets ready. And they don't have any relationship with God, so you don't believe me? When you get home, or before you get home, read those three lines of scripture and you'll see for yourself. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses, one uh, verses 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comfort us with all, in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So God comforts us, we comfort them with his comfort that he gave us because we don't have any comfort of our own. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verses, verse 23, you'll recognize this. First Thessalonians 5 and 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, complete to the end. That's encouraging. God is going to sanctify you from the beginning, amen, Sister Nubia, all the way to the end. Amen. That ought to make you jump to your feet and say, Hallelujah. We might have to deal with some stuff in between. 
But from the beginning to the end, God is going to sanctify us holy all the way to the end. Amen. Amen. Good God Almighty. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely perfect. Amen. And whole, W-H-O-L-E, complete in all its parts. No wanting, nothing unsound, entire. Without blemish or defect, free from sin, faultless. Those are all definitions you can find in the concordance. Amen. And the last scripture. We're going to end with the beginning. John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word won't harm me. Amen. Amen. Give God a praise.